So good afternoon and welcome. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's special event. Um, so today we have one of our book talks at the Ford School featuring the Ford School's very own assistant professor Megan Topkin Stang and her recently published book, Policy Patrons. So first of all, I hope you were able to help yourself for lunch as you came in. Um, there is plenty of food out there, and so we invite you to help yourself if you have not done so. Um, my colleague, Barry Rabe, will shortly give a context and a fuller introduction, but it really is my pleasure um, to congratulate Megan on her really impactful and insightful work that she will be presenting to us today. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Megan is an extremely popular teacher, so I'm not surprised to see many of our students here today, and that's, uh, that's always wonderful for us um, to do. And Megan, of course, is also well-respected by her faculty colleagues, and so it is really a great pleasure for me on behalf of the Ford School faculty to congratulate her on not only her first book, but also on the impact that her work is already having in this policy arena, and that I know it will continue to have. So Megan, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so with no further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Barry Rabe to the podium. Thank you, Susan. The role of ideas in the public policy process and how those ideas are adopted or not politically, are implemented or not through administrative channels, has been an enduring question in the social sciences and policy sciences at this university and in the evolution of this school. One thinks of the role of the late Michael Cohen ideas in the policy process, John Kingdon's classic work on policy streams and ideational contributions to policy. And today we celebrate the continuation of that great tradition here at Michigan, but with important new directions and twists that are rich for the continued theoretical development of those areas, but with profound importance for the development of policy going forward in education policy and more broadly. This book raises the issue not just what are the ideas, are the ideas good, but who pays for them? And who actively promotes them and puts them out there, particularly the context of foundations. Foundations that often are not created through democratic channels, but because an individual or a family has created a unique entity known as a foundation that decides to move into the marketplace of creating and encouraging and promoting ideas. There's an enduring American tradition for this, and yet we know remarkably little about how those decisions are made, how agendas are set, how those dollars are allocated, and particularly at a moment where we largely anticipate a reduction or retraction of prior commitments by the federal government mm -hmm. to funding the business of research, policy research, and idea development. The question of foundations becomes all the more significant. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help think reading this wonderful book, not only does this apply to education policy, which it so nicely does, but every arena of policy considered by this school. Megan, I really am looking forward to your sequel on climate, energy, and environmental <laughs> policy. And co-author. Because where I sit, the questions that you raise, for which I don't think there's been any scholarly response yet, are just timely, significant, and become growing in relevance through the passing of each, each month. So that is the larger context here. And yet I must say, building on Susan's comments about the author, how extraordinarily fortunate we are at the Ford School, but all readers of this book are or will be, to have a scholar like Megan be the person who put all of this together. For those of you who have worked with Megan, you know that she's an exemplary teacher. She is an exemplary scholar in every sense of this term, of that term. 
and it's been a pleasure and a privilege for me to work with her actually side by side for a number of years now in the public management portion of the curriculum, but also watching how this research project has evolved over a number of years, thinking through careful design of interviews, outreach, case selection, and then developing a framework for this book. Mm -hmm. This book was in the hands of a very capable and committed scholar, and we here at the Ford School are very, very fortunate on a daily, semesterly basis to be able to call Megan a colleague and friend. I certainly am, and please join me in welcoming the author of Policy Patrons to the stage, Megan. <laughs> That's a nice way to start. Um, thank you, Susan and Barry. Can you guys hear me? Yes. For that really kind and generous introduction. And I am really the one who's honored to get to be a part of this wonderful community. I also wanted to thank Aaron and Cliff and Laura for so beautifully planning this event and for the lovely lunch. I'm really excited to share this book with you. Many of you have sort of, see, again, seen this develop over time in bits and pieces. And my teaching has definitely influenced some of these ideas as well as I've worked on them for over the years. So I think you'll see a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in and that I actively speak about in class in this book as well. So I'm going to just offer some brief remarks for about the first 15 minutes. Then we're going to take questions. And I'd like to devote the majority of the time to having active discussion, as those of you who have taken my classes know. So starting with ripped from the headlines, as I am wont to do. New York Times, 2010, states embrace core standards for schools. LA Unified adopts a value-added approach to teacher ratings. Los Angeles Times, 2011, big paydays in Washington, D.C. schools merit system. New York Times, New Mexico could become the first state with preschool funding constitutionally guaranteed. And personalized learning increases use of computers in class. What do these very distinct and different cases have in common? They are all major policy innovations that have been championed, partially or fully funded, by private foundations. So core standards, very much a project at the Gates Foundation, LA Unified Value Added, Broad and Gates. DC, Broad, New Mexico, Kellogg. Personalized learning, anybody? Ford. No. <laughs> <laughs> but good guess, Zuckerberg. So this is the new entrant into this field, right? So tech philanthropy in Silicon Valley. But major policy issues in education, the way core curriculum is developed and implemented at a national scale, the way that teachers are evaluated and paid, in this case through differential compensation, the way that initiatives are funded at the state level, and the core technologies through which we deliver student learning, okay? All driven by large private foundations. And so, just to illustrate this, picture is worth a thousand words, Arnie Duncan and Eli Broad. Here we have Arnie. Arnie figures large in this, actually. Arnie and um, people from the Kellogg Foundation. There's Darren Walker from Ford um, at the Minnesota Federation of Teachers. And here's Barack Obama with the Gates. And um, Mark and Priscilla. And then, of course, our very own Michigan resident, Betsy DeVos. That was an interesting day. I woke up to about 100 texts. <laughs> um, but again, coming back to Barry's point, very timely in terms of policymakers coming to the fore through their philanthropic, philanthropic giving and advocacy work. So private power in the public realm. So the context matters. As Barry said, this applies in all areas of policy, but the area in which I rooted it is public education, K-12 education. At its core, this is very much, maybe until recently, a democratically governed state function, right? It is a tool, it is a, uh, an institution of the government, okay? But it's been strongly impacted by foundation involvement. I actually argue in the book that there is no sector more impacted than education in terms of philanthropic 
investment. And this has been true since the dawn of time. You know, foundations have been around for about 110 years. From the very first grants, public education was a priority, a favorite of philanthropists. And this has become even more amplified the last two decades because there are large entrants such as Gates into this field. And there's also been a huge growth of what we call mega foundations. So foundations that have in excess of $1 billion in their endowments. So just to put a little bit, this is all interesting too because as some of you know, there are significant legal restrictions on what foundations can and cannot do. They can't lobby at all in contrast to other 501c3 organizations. A lot of what they do is kind of behind the scenes, undercover. And that also shows why there's very limited scholarship on this topic, especially contemporaneously, because any work that you can do on this is done through archives after everyone has departed or <coughs> passed away, who are the relevant actors. So very, very limited contemporary work on foundation's policy engagement. So this leads me to the kind of the question of the book, the main core question, how and why do large philanthropic foundations seek to influence public education policy, K through 12 policy. And this is motivated by the fact that empirically we do know that larger foundations are much more likely to want to influence policy as a core strategic lever, four times more than smaller foundations. So this is a really big deal for our largest foundations that are rapidly growing as well. So here is just a picture of education funders writ large. 95, there were only about 16 foundations that had in excess of 1 billion. In 2010, it was more like 160. Okay. And then there was additional group of foundations that have more than $100 million. That's gone way, way up as well in 2010. This is giving by education funders. So back in 2000, about 500 million, that's gone rapidly up, almost exponentially. We don't have the data crunched yet to really know, but giving as a proportion, um, or give, the proportion of giving to policy-related work, policy and advocacy strategies, has also gone way, way, way up. So time will tell if this really is an exponential trend, but we do know that it's quadrupled in the past 15 years, okay? So the methods for this book, um, it's a qualitative study across case comparative analysis. I elected to look at four of the largest um, education funders who are active in policy, so four of the top 20. Um, I conducted semi-structured open-ended interviews over a period of about five years, wound up having about 60. They were all confidential. They are all anonymous. I've gotten some heat for this from people in the foundation world, but it's a long-standing tradition in qualitative research that if you give people a mask, they will tell you the truth, especially in such a sensitive, politically fraught area, where foundations actually can get in big trouble for doing too much political work. Okay. I talked to very high-level people at these foundations, presidents, policy officers, program officers, legal counsel, and I also talked to a selection of national grantee organizations of these foundations, people who are in charge of national associations or major uh, nonprofits, as well as some policymakers. I also conducted extensive archival analysis looking at the grants databases of these foundations. And I also had an 18 month period of participant observation where I actually, during grad school, worked at a large foundation that will remain nameless um, and firsthand experienced some of this tension in terms of philanthropists being very involved in influencing agenda setting in the policy process in education. So the four foundations that I chose, actually that I had access to, but that's another story. Gates, Broad, Kellogg, and Ford. So they vary in terms of location. They vary in terms of endowment. As you see, Gates dwarfs everybody else. These are still the top 20 of the top 20 foundations who fund education. Gates and Broad, founded in the late 90s, the first Silicon Valley technological boom, right? 
which you guys, I've learned, are too young to remember in some cases, which makes me feel so old. <laughs> I was in college. And whereas Kellogg and Ford founded in the 30s. So think John Dewey, very progressive era. And part of my argument in the book is that these foundation strategies now, when it comes to policy, are very much imprinted with the norms that were present at their founding dates. Okay? And so Gates and Broad, again, founded recently. They both have living benefactors. Their ethos, their values, their strategies are very much steeped in uh, technologically uh, motivated, market-based entrepreneurial logic, whereas Kellogg and Ford, again, much older, no living benefactors, their norms tend to be more about using words like social justice, civic engagement, community engagement. And what's interesting, and what initially drew me into this study, is given this tension of what foundations can or cannot do politically, they have very different comfort levels. So Broad and Ford are very similar in that they're very assertive, very unapologetic. Ford has been doing social justice work since they started. They were the main foundation in the 60s that was funding progressive racial equity work, and they actually got in trouble for that with Congress in the late 60s, which is what instituted those political restrictions in the first place. Broad has always been all about policy. Eli Broad says we do it, that's how we're gonna get things done. Whereas Gates prior to 2008 and Kellogg are much more reticent, much more cautious, much more like the quote someone said was, um, we don't wanna to touch that heater because it might get too hot. You know, like they want to influence policy and they're very active in doing it. They don't wanna put their own name brand on it. They prefer to go through their grantees. And then Gates since 2008, has been much more active, and that reflects a policy window opening, right? The Obama administration comes on, but still cautious. They're very much about their legal counsel, making sure all the I's and are dotted and the T's are crossed and they got their P's and Q's and every other letter of the alphabet going on, right? So they are very much about, we're going to do it, but we're gonna walk right up to the line. And that's Bill Gates' own words about their policy strategy. So this is a study, again, that took place over about five years. I used a grounded theory approach, um, which those of you in my qualitative methods class may be familiar with. I essentially went into these foundations knowing not much about them other than the types of grants they made and the program areas that they had. I didn't know anything about their norms. Again, there's not a lot of literature about how and why people do things. So this is all presented as a pretty little package of the four things. That came from years and years of back-end work. That bubbled up from the data in an iterative way, okay? So the key questions that emerged from that was that there were differences between these foundations in terms of how they manage grantees, in terms of the partners that they prefer to work with, in terms of how they frame problems and solutions, and in terms of how they evaluate results. So four engaged policy actors, very different ways. And one of my informants, you said this quote, there are basically two kinds of foundations. I heard this over and over again in different capacities from different people. And so the conceptual framework that I developed as a result of this research, I saw that same thing as well from an empirical perspective. And I termed these two types of foundations and their contrasting modes of policy engagement, outcome focused and field focused. So again, on the left, we have those four main themes or questions. And then we have the differing, uh, the, uh, the contrasting um, ways of going about their work. So I'm gonna throw some quotes at you. I don't wanna just you know, put them all on the, on the slide for you to read because that would be really awkward. So instead I'm just gonna dictate some to you here. So managing grantees centralized top down versus decentralized bottom up. This is when the, a policy initiative is managed at the foundation level and they choose grantees and enroll them into a project where the policy goals are already set at the foundation level. Whereas a decentralized is much more bottom up, right? The foundation delegates more, delegates more control to people in the field to decide on their own relevant policy targets, okay? Preferred partners, the outcome focused foundations like to work primarily with elites. That's what they think moves the initiative fast 
and efficiently. And people in the study over and over again called this grass tops approach, as opposed to grassroots, in case that wasn't obvious. Um, Field-focused foundations, polar opposite. They prefer to start with grassroots organizations, with people in communities, students, parents, teachers, right? As opposed to an elite or an expert-driven agenda. Framing of problems and solutions. This is a characterization that I've borrowed from a scholar called Heifetz at Harvard. Technical problems are those that are amenable to technical solutions, right? That you can say X leads to Y in a causal relationship. You can bring certain interventions to bear, and you know what the solution to the problem is, right? It's a more engineering-based mindset. Whereas adaptive problems are much seen as much more complex, multifaceted, involving more culture, social context, power differentials, things that are not necessarily in a regression equation, looking at my husband here. Um, <laughs> and then similarly, evaluating results. Quantifiable means that foundations are primarily wanting their results to be quantifiable. They want to see their impact expressed in calculable metrics, right? Whereas the integrated approach, and again, this is something I've borrowed from Liz Shore um, at the Center for Study of Social Policy, these foundations use both qualitative and quantitative metrics to show, to build a plausible and defensible case for their interventions as opposed to establishing proof, okay? So some examples from each one. For managing grantees, outcome-focused foundations, one person says, we treat our grantees as contractors, right? We formulate a goal and we hire people to fulfill it. On the field-focused side, I am not going to do what 95% of foundations do, which is come up with the answer and sell it. Ford Foundation. Partners, preferred partners, outcome focused. The first order of business was leveraging at the highest level the people who had the most influence. We're going to the superintendents, we're going to the mayors, we're going to the senators in the state government. Field focused, someone just said that's road. Who's that? Someone's read the book. Um, <laughs> I hope so. Um, field focused. If there's a policy direction that grows out of our work, it's come all the way through the bottom and up to the top. Right? So again, that's similar to the managing grantees, but it's about grassroots. That's a Kellogg person talking. Framing problems. Someone from Gates, an outcome focused approach. We're technocrats. We wish there was an app for that. <laughs> Focus, field focused. It's about building a field as opposed to injecting a specific idea or a specific technical solution. And it's what some people might call old school. Mm -hmm. Kellogg and Ford, remember from the 30s. And finally, evaluating results. Outcome focused, to give money to a school. Our benefactor, which is Eli Broad, needs to see the test scores rise at least 5% after one year. Gates, our outcomes were to get public policies changed. Kellogg, rather than just say the victory is the policy, we need a more complete picture of all the things that need to work to get that outcome we're looking for. Okay, so very, very distinct. And again, this by no means is a one size fits all, everyone fits in their own little box. As I said before, there's a lot of different elements that each foundation involves. They might be more reticent with policy influence, but they might be doing a field focused approach or an outcome focused approach, right? So broadly speaking, Gates and Broad fall into this category of outcome focused. And Ford and Kellogg fall into the field focus. But there's elements in which Ford especially is more outcome focused. And there's elements in which Gates is increasingly more field focused, which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay? A main theme throughout the book is that the outcome focused approach is dominant. It's commonsensical at this point. We're in a very managerial society. We've all you know, been marinating in this, in this approach for 30 years, you know, 30 years of neoliberalism, the new public management. Couple quotes. This is a, someone from Gates. It still seems like there was a little talk about field driven versus strategic grant making 10 or 15 years ago. There's still a few places here and there that do that kind of field based grant making, but they're really far, few and far between. So, describing kind of a convergence of approaches towards a much more outcome oriented approach has a common sense of appeal, particular mindset, and that's of course an MBA. Also reflected at Gates and Broad, market oriented. 
focusing on charter schools, competition, accountability, performance metrics derived from market principles, right? And then this has implications. As we talked about before a little bit, foundations are largely un unaccountable. So they're very active in policy, but they, don't, they can't get voted out of office. They don't sell a product that people can stop buying. They are literally only accountable to the IRS, which can come after them for their tax exempt status, the overstep. That has never happened once in 40 years of these regulations, 50 years almost. So they have very little, very few meaningful mechanisms of accountability. And so this is what winds up happening in this case. So this is, this is an interesting quote, because this is someone from Gates talking about this in a very self-reflective way. There's this twinkle in the eye of a senior staff member at Gates when Obama's education policy framework comes out. And they said, aren't we lucky that the administration's education agenda is so compatible with ours? And then there came the twinkle. We wouldn't take credit out loud, even amongst ourselves, but, you know, the twinkle. <laughs> so there's alignment and convergence, and a lot of this is due to, again, that elite-focused approach, building closely coupled relationships. At one point, someone told me an anecdote um, about someone from the Gates Foundation coming to talk at the Department of Education, and they had a Freudian slip and referred to it as the Gates Administration. But she said, everyone fell on the floor laughing because it's funny because it's true. So again, a lot of influence on what comes to the fore of the agendas in a public realm, but having very little accountability for it. And the same Gates person says, we have this enormous power to sway public conversations about certain issues, and we can mobilize lots of resources without robust debate. It's striking to me, okay? And here's what gets super interesting, at least to me. The outcome-focused foundations, their alignment with elites in policy initially caused a lot of impact, a lot of impact. This is from the Broad Foundation's annual report. We feel the stars have finally aligned with an agenda that echoes our decade of investments. Obama is posed, poised to cultivate and bring to fruition that seed that we have planted. Someone from Ford talking about the work that Gates and Broad has done. A national core curriculum like the Common Core, that was like the third rail. You just don't touch that in American politics. But now we have a Common Core, and we are moving towards a common protocol for teacher evaluations. Mind you, this was a quote from 2012. <coughs> so we know how the story ends, which I'll talk about in a minute, right? Someone from Brookings, or no, the Urban Institute. I'm amazed at what they've done. Look at how education is a high priority item in this country. It's singularly because of Gates and Broad. So they were able to get things on the agenda to move elite interests towards their chosen or their preferred models of social reform, right? But as the last couple of years have shown, even just the last year, which was crazy because this was all happening as I was finishing the book and I'm like, stop, stop, I can't even handle this, right? <laughs> there was a huge backlash. Those of you who are familiar with ad policy are familiar with, right? So Every Student Succeeds Act, President Obama signs this in December of 2015. This is essentially a referendum on most of the stuff that Gates and Broad has worked on for the last decade. It devolves a lot of control back to the states. It essentially dismantles their work on the Common Core, leaving that to the states as well, as opposed to being more of a federal mandate. And also, a huge backlash against high-stakes testing, the value-added evaluation. Right, so this all happens. And then Gates Foundation issues a mea culpa. So this is from their annual letter in June 2016 from Sue Desmond Hellman, who is their CEO. We missed an early opportunity to sufficiently gauge educators, also parents and communities. This has been a challenging lesson for us to absorb, but we take it to heart. Female jaws drop all around the world, right? This is really interesting that Gates is now doing this. And the Melinda Gates saying in the Washington Post, community buy-in is huge. It means that in some ways you have to go more slowly. This could not be more distinct from what they were doing for the past 10 years. It is striking, okay? 
Oh, and then Randy Weingarten, again, Gates is now moving that away from a top-down managerial approach. Okay, I'm like, yeah, I told you, but great. Um, I kid. Uh, what's the balance? I think this is really the core question coming out of the book, and that also motivates me in my work. So this is another Gates Inform, and I apologize for all the lengthy quotes. This will be one of the last ones. How do you establish a top or a bottom-up versus top-down mix? This is a puzzle we've never resolved. It's very tricky. At the beginning, we were too top-down. Bottom-up seldom came up with the breakthrough thinking. The higher risk, what was possible without constraints types of ideas. The big think things came from a tight group of people with a blank sheet of paper. Or as one of my informants described it, Six guys, in a, six guys in a room with two McKinsey consultants. <laughs> and just putting it all out there, right? People really start talking when they have a mask, I will say. A bottom-up approach, so this is a national nonprofit leader, very well known. A bottom-up approach is a more effective way to do policy change and philanthropy. Because in the long run, you really need to have that democratic element to make it stick. And this is the argument I'm seeing now that democratic engagement, civic engagement, community rootedness is desirable because it makes the outcomes more effective. Because again, that's an outcome-focused approach. Whereas a field-focused approach, it's more in their DNA. They're progressive. Their core norms are about community engagement. So again, they're doing the same thing, but for different reasons, okay? So that leaves us with all sorts of things we can talk about. As Barry said, the role of foundations in this new policy world that we're in. Anything you guys would like to talk about? I really appreciate your engagement, and I look forward to answering questions. <laughs> yes, I don't know your name. I'm sorry. My name's Avi. I was just wondering, uh, do these foundations have political alignments, and how does that um, The question was for the live stream, do these foundations have political alignments? Progressive versus conservative. Yeah. Yeah. So intentionally, I, so the top 20 foundations are mostly progressive in nature. Gates is sort of more neutral. Broad is very unapologetically progressive or liberal. Kellogg and Ford are the same. So they're all on the progressive end of the scale. Foundations are not supposed to have out front political alignment. They can't say we support Donald Trump or we support Hillary Clinton. Like that's not allowed. But we see a lot of evidence of the benefactors of the foundations, they're giving as private citizens, tends to align more with Democratic Party. Does that make sense? Yes, what's your name? Jeremy. Jeremy, Jeremy. thank you. I'm a senior, and I was wondering, what do you think are like the biggest educational changes that are trying to push kind of at this moment, mm -hmm. um, and which foundations are kind of really leading the charge? That's a really good question. Um, you know, a year ago, my response would have been a lot different. I think after this whole, you know, the ESSA and uh, backlash to Common Core and value added, people are kind of in a holding position, especially given the election and, you know, DeVos being appointed. And there's just a sense like we don't know what to do and we need to figure this out because the same rules are not applying. So what I have seen is, again, going back to Zuckerberg Chan initiative, they actually hired someone who was at the Department of Education and prior to that was at Gates. Um, so going in sort of that same vein, which very much aligns with an outcome focused approach, they have embraced personalized learning. So again, like personalizing lessons online and with computers to students, a very technical approach, one that is not necessarily dependent on policy wins. So I can see a little bit, I, I would hypothesize that perhaps that's a reaction to feeling like we have no control over the political realm and want to do something that's more contained. Does yeah. that make sense? So. Mm -hmm. Effie. Yeah, so the question was, to what extent do these foundations sort of collaborate, collude, compete, <laughs> all the different Cs? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, Gates traditionally has kind of framed itself as we don't work with other people, um, but they do, but they kind of don't like to be tied to other people's brands in case something goes wrong. Broad works with other, Broad works a lot with Gates and Walton. They're kind of like the big three, you know, Diane Ravitch calls them the billionaire boys club. Kellogg and Ford tend to be more, like they will be part of national coalitions of like 15 or 16 foundations to do things, especially Kellogg, because they're very uncomfortable with being in the public eye. And they kind of like, the words that one informant used, they like to kind of water it down a bit by being 
one of 15 funders on an initiative. So again, the, <laughs> the quote that I kept hearing is you've met one foundation, you've met one foundation. And I think that's very true. It just really kind of depends on the culture and the staff and the sort of norms that the benefactor sat down even 80 years ago. Yeah. Dicko. Um, so the story's a bit depressing. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Or take the bottom up approach, uh, build community, etc. But it's so contingent, you never know yep. the outcome that you desire. And it's messy. The democratic process is very messy, right? And, and gets diverted. So, do you have any examples that you can cite for us where there has been a top down approach mm -hmm. by a foundation where the policy has stuck, mm -hmm. uh, the presumably enlightened policy has stuck and hasn't been overcome by the kind of backlash we're seeing now? That's a great question. So, the question was are there examples? of this sort of non-binary sort of top-down versus bottom-up, depressing versus not depressing. Um, yeah, so actually the Ford Foundation is probably the example I would point to as having been the most effective because they are really deliberate about balancing those two things. So they are working directly with elites, directly with policymakers. You know, half of the cabinet of the um, of John F. Kennedy's uh, <laughs> uh, presidency was drawn directly from the Ford Foundation. They called it a revolving door, right? So they're very much closely coupled with that, but they also are very, very deliberate about having this much more field-oriented approach with grantees and also with communities. So they have people going into the field. They hire people from these communities, not just people from Harvard, right? So they could kind of try to balance that. And that's manifested in a lot of different ways, not so much their recent education work, which has been focused around um, getting policies passed that are about expanded learning time, so longer school days and longer school years. Um, but it has been effective in terms of some of their more historically famous work in terms of the civil rights movement. They were instrumental in the Civil Rights Act, um, getting that passed, supporting people who were going to, um, you know, Freedom Summer in 1964, that sort of thing. But it's again, it's very behind the scenes. They've also been really successful in the 70s with school finance reform, which you would never know about, right? So they are, again, working with elites and experts, developing new studies and scholarship that will influence the ideas, and also working directly with teachers on the ground. So I think they're the best example I can think of, of at least in these large foundations, one that's striking that balance pretty well. Eduardo. So the question is, <laughs> are, there, are there efforts to limit foundations' influence in the public sphere? That's a, it's a really great question. Um, there have been periodic efforts to do that over the past 100 years. Um, there was, the first one was in like 1912. Foundations were under fire for supporting the Ludlow Massacre, and they had the Walsh Commission. So that was robber barons, right? They were worried about robber barons being philanthropists. In the 50s, it was communism kind of the opposite, like are these foundations fomenting communism? In the 60s, it was, wow, the Ford Foundation is holding voter registration drives in black neighborhoods in Cleveland. Right? So there's been periodic efforts by Congress to sort of censure them. And the most effective of those was the 60s, late 60s, when they said, here are the political re regulations. Since then, there are periodic little blips. Um, you know, there's talk now about, you know, since Citizens United, maybe foundations should be able to lobby just like everyone else. But then there's a perennial argument that they're tax exempt and so they shouldn't be subsidized by the government for being political, right? They're supposed to be more neutral. But what I did get from my various interviews is that people think one of these waves is coming, right? So there hasn't been a big wave since the last, the late 1960s. And all the signs kind of point to the same conditions that were at stake then. People, there's a lot of income inequality and energy around that. Um, people kind of questioning why should these foundations be tax exempt and you'll know, basically be taking money that would otherwise be in the treasury and holding them in these huge endowments. So it comes in the form of more, let's increase the payout rate. You know, all foundations have to give 5% of their assets annually. People have said, let's raise that to 10% or let's mandate that these foundations sunset, which means that they have to close after 25 years and they have to spend down. But nothing really major except for those little things. But I wouldn't be surprised if something comes up soon. Yes? 
Your name? Um, so there's a, a cynical take on um, Broden, the Broden Gates, mm -hmm. which, which would say that not only did they kind of misevaluate or misestimate what they were doing, but that they were uh, inspired to do so perhaps by alliances with testing companies or mm -hmm. with um, people who are very excited to buy or sell iPads in every classroom. <laughs> um, and there's circumstantial evidence for this, say, in Chicago or LA, where mm -hmm. there's kind of intense intermingling, say, between new schools for Chicago or Renaissance 2010 mm -hmm. or whatever, and executives and tech companies and testing companies. So in, in your experience in, in around these philanthropies, what, what evidence do you see for this most cynic, the, the kind of most cynic, cynical account of what these philanthropies may have gotten That's wrong? a great question. The question was, um, what evidence am I seeing of a more cynical or less cynical view towards this, these foundations work? Are they sort of aligned with corporate interests? Have other things in mind besides the public good? I mean, it's a, it's a really, it's a hot debate, honestly, always. I think in the last five years, it's taken up a lot more energy, and it's also become less marginalized as a viewpoint. It used to be, oh my gosh, the corporate reformers are just wanting to make money off the poor children. I think there's less of that now, partially because the mainstream view has shifted left. Um, I th I, my personal opinion from looking at these um, for so many years is that I personally don't find that in these foundations. I'm sure there are foundations in which that's happening, but I do think that the people in these foundations do have very good intentions. I think they have blind spots about privilege and power and wealth and their lack of knowledge about effective communities. But in terms of that very cynical view about everyone wants to profit or make test uh, profit off of these companies or massive testing, I'm sure some of that comes into play. Um, but I, don't, I honestly don't think that it infuses their work. I think that they are ethical actors who make some mistakes in terms of their execution as opposed to fundamentally bad human beings. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, back here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, what was the difference? The question was, what's the difference between attention paid to sort of the agenda setting phase of policy and then more implementation? It, it was divided along these two lines. So the outcome-focused foundations tended to be more about sort of the big picture, let's get people on board, let's quickly move the policy, and then we'll sort of, again, contract out the implementation. So that lack of attention to the implementation, I think that's why they didn't see that they needed to engage political strategy on the ground. Whereas Kellogg and Ford were very much about the implementation and sort of having longer term relationships with their grantees that enabled them to think through those things more at the outset. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, my name is Andrew. Thank uh, you. What's your opinion on image and broad spending? Mm. And uh, how do you think that will impact student and teacher evaluation for the future mm. along with the common core? Yeah, so personalized learning, what's my opinion? Um, and how will that influence evaluate? That's a really, that's a, that's a more higher edish question, but I like it. Um, yeah, it applies everywhere. Yeah. You know, I am, I am not cynical. I am skeptical because there have been so many iterations of the same sort of idea. So in the outcome-focused foundations, they tend to be focusing more on structural reforms. In the early 2000s, it was let's make the schools small or let's make the classes small, and that's going to be what fixes education. It's about class size. And now it's about, you know, students need more individualization of their lesson plans, work at their own pace. We can cut a lot of waste through technology. I personally, given that I am, you know, someone who has studied a lot of John Dewey <laughs> and um, education policy, I personally think that, that I, I personally, my biased view is that I don't think it's a scalable solution to fix all of education. I think um, that there's a place for personalized learning, but I'm skeptical of efforts to make it such a central component of some public schools. And that's really happening in California right now, mostly due to Gates and Chan Zuckerberg initiative. Um, yeah, and I mean, the trend towards quantifiable teacher evaluations, you know, there's a lot of empirical evidence about how those can be skewed against you know, women or faculty of color, um, and that it creates bad incentives for people to give better grades. It's interesting. It's certainly personalized learning will provide more of that granular data that can influence 
how people are evaluated um, as teachers. Um, but yeah, it's a really good question. I'll have to think more about that. I haven't made that connection to teacher evaluation specifically. Mm -hmm. Erica. So one of the um, biggest problems that I have heard all the time mm -hmm. in education is teacher pay. Mm -hmm. um, do you think foundations have any role in such an infrastructure level problem in um, education, or did any of the foundations you spoke to to that? Yeah, so the question from Erica was, Merit pay differential compensation is a big deal and has been for a while. What was the second part of the question? Do foundations have a role? Do foundations have a role? Yeah, I mean, it's a great example. I think like the historical literature on foundations and sort of some of the normative arguments about the role of foundations is that foundations are supposed to be like the research and development arm of society. Or Paul Ilvesacker, who's a famous Ford Foundation president, calls it um, America's passing gear, for those of you who like drive stick, which I don't. Um, yeah, so that it can, it has discretionary capital that the government doesn't. The government can't experiment on the public dime. They have to serve the median voter, right? So foundations have the luxury of being able to pilot innovations, and then maybe the best ones will get scaled up for broader implementation. So that's kind of in the historical role of foundations. And that's the role that Broad has played with differential compensation in Denver and in DC. They had philanthropic money paying out this effectiveness pay for teachers in both those cities. And then eventually, those reforms got incorporated into the contracts, the teacher contracts. And that was more of a ground up strategy. They actually did work with, um, with teachers and with teachers unions to do that. So I have no problem at all with foundations investing in those sorts of pilot programs. I do have a problem when it becomes wholesale policy, especially in environments that are perpetually cash strapped, because what you know, resource deprived public school system is going to say, sorry, Gates, don't want your pilot funding, right? It's almost a false choice. So that's my concern. There's a power differential. You know, everyone says, oh, those who elect no wrong can be done to them. But I think, you know. A foundation grant from a Gates or a Broad is more than just financial capital. It's also prestige. It's social connections. It's political capital as well. So that's my biased opinion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so it also kind of uh, begs the question, what, why, why do we have this like, weird legal category of a foundation in the first place? Mm -hmm. and Great question. So the question was, why do we have this weird thing, <laughs> this weird, very American category of private foundations, and should we have it? I mean, I think that's a really important point that's starting to come more to the fore. Um, I mean, it's a very odd thing. I mean, foundations were only differentiated from other 501c3s in 1969. Public charities can lobby, they can advocate up to about 25% of their budget. Foundations can't do that at all. And that is the only distinction in the tax code. And that grows out of a particular congressman, uh, Bob Patman from Texas, having a real agenda or have ven a vendetta against foundations because he thought that they were funding his challengers in the political arena. So that's where that restriction came from. It's very arbitrary. There's no kind of historical uh, precedent for it. But now we're seeing kind of the opposite end. We're seeing Chan Zuckerberg, for example. You guys think that was a 501c3? He gave $45 million to an LLC. $45 billion to an LLC. And that's a new form of philanthropic investment called impact investing. And that gives you more leeway. You don't have to limit yourself in terms of lobbying. You don't have to just make grants. You can make investments, much like you would in a regular company. And so at least among sort of new entrants to this space, that's becoming slowly you're starting to see that um, more and more in terms of what they elect to do. They're not just going for the private foundation anymore. Maybe they're going to a donor advised fund at a large mutual fund where they have some control, but they don't have the overhead of a foundation. So the model that we see that's started in 1910 is Again, we don't have enough data to make generalizations, but we're certainly seeing a lot of really interesting things happening that I didn't see five years ago. And I think it's very contested terrain, and in some cases, it's 
you know, happening as I speak. <laughs> it's a very dynamic field right now. So I mean, from not that I have $45 billion, but if I did, I would probably think very hard about putting it into an LLC. You don't get the tax benefits, but assuming you have $45 billion, it's probably not gonna be that big of a deal. It gives you more freedom, gives you less stress about, oh my gosh, are we gonna get censured by the IRS? So I think a lot of people are starting to explore alternative models or institutions in terms of how they give money away. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Zuckerberg and his philanthropic colleagues raised upwards of $100 million mm -hmm. for New York City mm -hmm. schools and enrollment there is a little bit less than what it is in the Detroit public mm -hmm. schools now. And originally, Mayor Brooker and Governor Christie were very, very sympathetic. But I think after five years or so, there's pretty much consensus that that money had many more minimal effects than one anticipated, mm -hmm. since it was a rather large amount of money for a 45,000 student, 45, student district. 45 student, that would be even yeah. worse. <laughs> Do you think that that will have any effect on these large foundations? I mean, depending upon their charter, mm -hmm. they can get out supporting education and go back to buying Monet's and- Sure. Oh, very <laughs> right. in art. Uh, is there a consequence of the Newark experience mm -hmm. for these large foundations? That's a really great question. Um, so the question was this high profile case of Newark Public Schools getting $100 million from Mark Zuckerberg in concert with Chris Christie and Cory Booker. Dale Rusukoff wrote, this, uh, wrote about this in a great book um, called The Gift. Basically showed that that money mostly was tied up in bureaucracy and funding consultants and that very little of it got to the classroom and the students. I mean, I think absolutely. I think for Zuckerberg in particular, that lesson has meant that he's not putting his money into a foundation. He is still giving money. He gave $120 million to Bay Area public schools, like around uh, Redwood City in California. So it's not like he's not giving that money. He's just doing it in a different way that allows him, I think, more leeway and not having to, again, it's about disruption. It's like not having to work with the messy bureaucratic state. It's more efficient. It's more effective. He can do more things under his own control. So yeah, I do think, I think a lot of these sort of big, laudable gifts that get a lot of media attention. Um, people are thinking about it in a more nuanced way as opposed to, yes, this money will fix. And again, it's a drop in the bucket, right? $100 million against um, what a school or a school district actually needs to survive and overcome these major issues. Um, again, it's not a technical solution. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, what are these outcome-focused foundations doing to be more field-focused? And is there a danger that that's astroturfing, sort of appearing to do it, but kind of co-opting the actual value to have that appearance, but not necessarily doing things that are substantive? Yeah, I mean, again, it's very recent. It's only been since late 2015, 2016 that I'm seeing this from Gates. What I'm seeing is... Um, more language and verbiage coming from the CEO about we need to be more humble. And one of Gates's core values that they put on every wall is we need to be humble and mindful. But I think they're actually bringing in more efforts to do more like privilege, implicit bias awareness, like actually focusing on issues of race and power, which were previously unmentionables in many foundations. New Schools Venture Fund, didn't even think about that. Huge blind spot, right? But important in terms of a more bottom-up approach. I'm seeing, I've seen a couple instances where Bill Gates has gone to meet with teachers in various cities and says, we really need to learn from you. So he's doing some of that. I, I don't know that it's happened more than two or three times, but I think, you know, that's happening. Um, Broad is an interesting example because they are, they're very top down as well, but they do in certain instances have more engagement on the ground. So like in New Orleans, they've been instrumental in converting New Orleans to charters. And people have different opinions about that, but they have worked on the ground quite a bit with schools, parents, and those types of, of kind of community rooted strategies. 
But again, I think time will tell. I don't know. I mean, that's, it's a really interesting question because I think if you're doing it to get better outcomes and it's not really a core part of your, the, your institutional DNA was the phrase I kept hearing, harder to maintain that and really root that in the culture and have your staff take ownership over it. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Jeff. I, uh, in, in your research, did you, um, is there a lot that came up out of some of the evaluation think tanks or even some of the academic research that comes out of this? And I say this because you don't hear a lot of, a lot of negative results coming from some of the evaluation studies mm -hmm. or the research that comes out. And I worry about some of the think tanks and faculty that live off of some of the soft money that Gates and other foundations provide. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I just wanted to know what your feelings were about both that for higher ed, but also for the foundation mm -hmm. and potential solutions. Yeah, so the question was, what's the role of sort of these think tanks producing evidence, um, academic researchers not necessarily publishing discrepant results? So kind of to that point about an echo chamber, we're funding everyone who does advocacy and all these organizations singing from the same hymn book are all getting money from us. I mean, that's actually a good plug because I am now writing a book about that <laughs> with a friend from uh, Michigan State University, Sarah Reckhow, who is just brilliant, brilliant political scientist. And that project um, looks at how research on teacher evaluation is used to influence policy. And it draws a distinction between more like think tank advocacy research and academic research. And we show through various network models how we basically trace an infrastructure in which this research travels and to what extent it's taken up and why and by who. So we're doing both interviews and discourse network analysis. So, I mean, the empirical evidence, there isn't a lot about it in the foundation world, but in other fields, there's been quite a lot of evidence that, you know, the think tank stuff, if it's funded by a foundation, more likelihood that it's going to be offering a less nuanced view right they are that's one of the characteristics of advocacy research is that it doesn't waff wafer waver waffle waver <laughs> um right whereas an academic piece might say might hedge its bets a bit more say there's uncertainty here this is not the answer whereas advocacy research might say value added is the right way to do things that makes sense so stay tuned for those results we doing okay on time yeah mm -hmm. so I would just be very interested in your opinion because you probably know so much more than I will ever know about this. Maybe not. <laughs> and um, I was just interested in how you viewed education and mm -hmm. what policies have actually worked and specifically, mm -hmm. Put specifically me on the spot. For, uh, for lower income mm -hmm. families. Yeah. Children. So my question was my personal or scholarly opinions about what has worked in education. I know it hasn't worked. And what hasn't worked is over-quantification of test scores, right? So you see what happened in Atlanta. There's a huge cheating scandal. And that is because there were certain high-stakes cutoffs that the schools had to meet in order to be making adequate yearly progress and are no child left behind. So efforts to, one of my informants called it, make the indicator of an outcome the outcome in and of itself. So the outcome is supposed to be student learning, but the indicator is the test score, but the test score becomes what we're actually going towards. And Campbell's law, the more quantitative you make an indicator, the more likely it is that you can game it or that you will game it. So there's that. I also think there's been some really interesting research lately about how important race of the teacher is to students in low-income schools. Exposure to a black male teacher in elementary school, something like, 40% more likely controlling for all these other variables that students would go on to college. So race matters a lot, and that's kind of late, late breaking news. So I don't know the specifics, I need to find that study, but um, yeah, I think efforts to have teachers that look like the children that they're teaching are really fruitful and promising. I think efforts to continue to pay teachers more and respect them and make their profession valued and compensated therein. I think, I mean, that's my little armchair theory of what's gonna work. We, we pay the teachers more, we respect them, we diversify that profession and have a more field-focused approach, quite honestly. That's what I came to at the end of writing this book, although I didn't go in with that. I kind of, yeah, I kind of drank the Kool-Aid about the outcome-focused first 
and then I, I came, I had a different opinion. So I think we're at time. Thank you so much for the wonderful discussion. <laughs> <laughs>